Uh, so I'm glad to be here. And uh, you know, I don't know how much you know about the history of this course, but it really came out of the microarray uh, course, right? Uh, about eight years ago, it was all the rage was to build your own microarrays, and then there was a, a week of uh, analysis tagged onto that, and which has now grown into this uh, data analysis course. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll be teaching. Uh, several lectures. This one is somewhat disconnected from what I'll be talking about most of the rest of the week, which is about gene regulatory networks and how you model those and transcription factors and how you model their binding specificity. But just as a, a way to get uh, warmed up on, on this, uh, we'll be talking about uh, gene ontology categories today. Um, and what I'll be talking about is essentially two different <coughs> conceptual approaches to statistically score the association between a gene set, let's say a Go category, and uh, an expression profile, right? And there's there's two ways of, of approaching this question, both of which are, I think the first one is very well known, is based on Fisher's exact test or the hypergeometric distribution, and there's a zillion implementations of, of this idea. Uh, it is very easy to do it in R yourself, actually, and so we're gonna do a tutorial after this relatively short lecture uh, to, to work through this and to use the, the R packages. You know, you need to know um, what the Go categories are, so we'll need the gene ontology package in R, uh, and also we'll need to, uh, uh, need to know what genes are associated with it in the particular organism, so we'll use those kind of annotation and gene ontology packages, but then beyond that, it's all plain R to then do the statistics of the, of the scoring, right? And I think it's useful to, to do this in with as basic as possible commands so you really know what, your, what the assumptions are, et cetera. Um, the other approach is to test for differences in the distribution of the actual gene expression values between the genes in a gene set of interest. Again, uh, in our case, a gene ontology category and, um, and, you know, the, um, and the rest of the genome. So uh, let's let's start with the with the first approach, and that's based on the uh, the hypergeometric distribution. And then Naomi has talked a little bit about two by two tables, and uh, right, and uh, being away from from a random distribution there. Um, but I'm going to uh, to to talk about this again in, in somewhat different terms. I think you, you you may find it useful to hear this in different ways. It's a very basic thing that I think you should be very comfortable with at the end of this course because uh, there's many applications of, of the hypergeometric uh, distribution beyond the Go categories, right, that you'll probably in your career will use many, many times. Um, so let's, let's talk about what, what, the, what the question is. Um, and, you know, I'm assuming that all or most of you are familiar with gene ontology, that you've, you know that there's these uh, annotations of, <coughs> of gene function um, you know, at, at some different level, cellular component, like what part of the cell, right, is this gene important for, uh, what kind of molecule is it, is it an enzyme, or is it a structural uh, protein, uh, et cetera, um, right? And so for the purpose of this talk, it's just a, a source of sets of genes, right? So we have our universe of all genes in the genome, right? And now depending on the organism, there's going to be uh, maybe 6,000 genes if you're talking about yeast, or there can be 20,000 yeast if you're talking about human, right? And we need some notation to define this number. I'll be using capital N for the total number of genes. All right, so that's the size of our universe. And now, uh, and you should think of this circle as containing, you know, N points, right? Each of which is a gene, and all these genes are actually distinguishable from each other, right? They're, uh, we're keeping track of which gene is which. Now, if you're talking about um, one of those gene sets or Go categories, it's a subset, a subsample of this, of this universe of all genes, right? Uh, and I'll be using the symbol capital K for this, right? This is, our, this is the population, N, the size of the population, and then within that population there's a set of successes, right? Um, and those are the genes that are in the Go category, right? It's about sampling marbles from an urn, if you have like blue and red marbles and you think the red marbles are the ones that are the genes in the Go category, right? Whenever you pick a red marble out of the urn, um, that's, that's a success from the point of view of the statistical process. Right? Now, if we've done an expression experiment, right, an RNA-seq or, or a micro-experiment, right, 
um, will have as many numbers as there are genes, right? Um, you could do a, an experiment where you only keep track of absolute expression, right? So the mRNA abundance, or maybe the log of that. Uh, but typically, we'll be looking at differential expression between a reference condition and some test condition, right? Or, or you know, the difference between two individuals, etc. Right? There could be all kinds of contrasts that you're analyzing with lima, for instance, which you've, you've heard about. Okay? So, but the bottom line is there is some number associated with with every gene, right? So we have a vector of numbers across all the genes. Um, Using those numbers themselves, that's one way of, of dealing with the go categories. And that's the second way that we'll be getting to in a little bit, right? But um, you've also learned how you can score for differential expression. And you can ask the question for every gene, is this log ratio uh, significantly different from zero, right? Is, are these two expression values significantly different from each other, uh, accounting for multiple testing, uh, given that you have lots of genes, et cetera? So, um, Let's assume that you've done this, and you've done a micro-experiment, compared two conditions, gone through all the statistics to find the differentially expressed genes, right? And you've settled on the set of genes that, that were, say, upregulated uh, between these two conditions. Okay. Now, this set of genes that was upregulated, that is um, um, another subset of the same universe, right, of population of all genes. So I'm going to draw another small circle here and I'll, I'm, I'll be labeling that little n. Now, little n is the sample size, right? So little n and big K are both subsets of the same set of big N genes, right? But they're two different subsets. And then here, in this intersection between these two circles, those are the genes that are both in my sample, in my set of differentially expressed genes, and in my go category, or my you know predefined gene set. Um, and the question I'm now asking is, is this overlap larger than expected? Right? That's the essence of Fisher's exact test, or using the hypergeometric. Is, uh, and, and so there's, there's a few ways of, of writing this question. Uh, and uh, since I'm tall, I can use the upper part of the blackboard, so I'll just put it here. Right? We're basically asking, is the success rate in the population, big K, right, divided by big N, so you're asking what fraction of the big circle is this small circle of K genes in the Go category, right? I'm asking whether this is the same as the proportion within the sample, right? So is the number of genes in the Go category, you know, within my set of genes that were upregulated, the same as that fraction in the whole genome, right? So let's say you have a situation where um, Say in yeast, you have 6,000 genes, right? And you have a Go category that contains 60 genes. So what is the success rate of like being in, in that Go category a priori? One in 100, right? It's 6,000 divided by 60. Uh, at some point, we'll be talking about the binomial distribution and the p parameter in the binomial. It's kind of related to that, right? It's the success rate, um, right? So I expect that one in a hundred, 60 over 6,000 genes. If I pick one gene at random, the chances of, of that being in this Go category are one in a hundred. Right? So that also means that if I have a sample of size n, right? That I, if I multiply it by this success rate, big K over big N, right? What is this? This is the expected number of successes in my population, right? And so you can see, if you look at this formula over here, if I just multiply both sense by sides by little n, right? I'm getting this equation. And you can see I'm really asking the question, is little k, the size of the overlap, the same as the expected value, right? That's the essence of the, of the Fisher's exact test. Now, um, it's easy to ask this question. Um, if you want to compute a p-value, right, it's a little more complicated. You have to think about what is the statistic, what is the null distribution of that statistic. And so it turns out that it's not a good idea to just take this ratio and, you know, there's not a test that you plug in both the 
the expected success ratio and the observed success ratio in your sample, right? Instead, you're going to focus on the size of the overlap, little k, as the parameter of interest. That's my statistic, right? And I want to know what is the null distribution of this uh, statistic, given the other three numbers. Question? Yeah, so that's, that's, a, that's a good question. Actually, in the tutorial, we'll be dealing with this uh, explicitly. It has to do with, uh, with what is the universe, right? If I refer to your question. So what is the, what is the universe? Is the set of all genes that have been found in the genome and annotated in one of those databases like UCSC, right? Or is it all the genes that were spotted on the array, right? And in, in particular, let's say you're analyzing some older data or you're analyzing microarray data where not every spot may have given you a good, good signal, right? Um, right? There's some genes left out, uh, not because they don't exist in the genome, but because you didn't get the good value for, uh, for them in the genome, right? Um, it's so th th there can be a subtle thing with, for instance, the genes that have low mRNA abundance associated with them, right, in the cell, those are more likely to have spots that didn't give a good, you know, uh, ratio, right? And they were left out of the uh, analysis. And but genes that have a low expression value could also be part of Go categories that tend to be expressed at a low value. For instance, signaling proteins, transcription factors, or you know, genes that you don't need a lot of more regulatory uh, proteins than structural proteins. So if you're not careful, right, you may end up with categories that are uh, enriched just because the universe that you're using is not appropriate, right? And so um, th this does require some thought, and we'll probably get back to it uh, on the other side of the building where we, we talk about the, you know, the, the specific R implementation. But that's a good point. Okay. But let's assume that we've done this properly, right? And that, and that um, really the, the expected overlap between these two sets, you know, is would be based on picking one of these subsets again from the population, but randomly, right? So the null hypothesis is that we're scrambling, and of course, you know, there's two subsets, but we can always leave one of them intact and then think about randomizing the other subset or vice versa, right? That's equivalent to randomizing both of them, right? So let's, because we think of the Go category as the pre-existing prior data, right, that we're trying to use to interpret our new experiment, let's assume that we, we leave the Go category untouched, right? And then we're imagining what would happen if I we would pick these N genes from the genome again, but now randomly, right? Um, and the question is, how often, you know, do you observe, uh, or no, well, it's not the question how often do you observe this overlap K, but uh, but it's the question about it being more extreme than what you observe, which Naomi briefly talked about. And we'll talk about it in more detail, right? So that's our null model. We're just sampling these N genes again, randomly from this population, uh, big N. But we're doing it without replacement, right? So we're drawing the first gene, and then we're drawing the second gene. Right? It's like drawing marbles from an urn uh, containing N marbles total, right? But we're not pu putting the marbles back. We're drawing all these N marbles um, without a replacement. Yeah, I'll, I'll go back to this uh, multiple testing uh, issues, actually. Um, here's uh, the, um, uh, let's see. Um, this is the, I, I want to give you a sense of this uh, from a few perspectives. Uh, the last thing you want to do probably is to use Excel, right? Um, so we're here to learn R so we don't have to use Excel, right? But it's still useful to uh, be aware of, of how Excel uh, uses or parameterizes the hypergeometric distribution and how R does it, because it's actually different, right? And if you don't know, it could be confusing, right? So let's, let's talk about this for, uh, for a little bit. Um, what you see here is the same as this Venn diagram but just in a different uh, representation, right? Um, this, this is a two by two table. It's this part of the table that's, you know, is the two by two table. These are the margins. They contain sums over either rows or, or columns, right? Um, and then using GOI for gene of interest. So that's the set of our genes of interest. It's, for instance, our upregulated genes, right? That's the sample that has n little n members, 
And then there's the genes that are not um, in this uh, set of genes of interest. Right? So if you look here in the right column, you see there's little n genes that are in this set, and there's the remainder of them within the population, big N minus little n, are um, not in the set of genes of interest. This thing that is either yes or no, what is this called in statistics or in R? What kind of object would that be? It's logical, but uh, there's something that has takes multiple levels. Yeah, is a categorical variable in R. It's called a factor, right? So a factor has multiple levels. For instance, true and false, or yes or no, right? Um, in this case, we have a two-level factor, right? And this is a table, just a table. If you would run the table command on a little indicator for every gene, whether it's in this cluster or a set of upregulated genes or not, right? You would get a table that has this and this number. And we'll be doing this uh, again uh, in the in the in the tutorial very soon, right? But there's not just one thing we're keeping track of of every gene. That is whether it's in our cluster or in our set of upregulated genes, right? We're also keeping track of whether it's in our Go category of interest or not, right? So just to make it very clear, we're only talking about one Go category at this point, right? We'll be we'll be talking about you know multiple testing of multiple categories. Of course, we'll have to deal with that. But let's now first ask the question, if I have one category, for instance, signal transduction genes, right? Um, how do I do the scoring for that one category? So there's two factors that, that you know, have a value for every gene. One takes these two levels. It's in the, in the cluster or not. The other takes the value. It's in the Go category or not. So you see, this is the size of the overlap. This is the total size of the Go category. And of course, then, you know, the number of genes outside of my sample that are, um, that are, in the, that are not in the Go category is then big K minus little k over there, right? So you can see um, how this works out. It has to add up in every column. It has to add up in every row. And if you add up these four cells of the 2 by 2 table, you get the total number of genes. And this is the uh, actual uh, equation of the hypergeometric. Um, and this is the Excel command that you would use. Um, and this is the, the equation that defines the hypergeometric uh, distribution. It's the probability of little k given the other three parameters. Right? So we're asking, what's the probability if I have k genes in my Go category and I have little n genes in my sample, and I have a total of n genes, right? What is the probability of getting an overlap equal to little k? And the motivation for this equation, I'm not going to derive it, but it's um, it has to do with how many ways you can pick the successes, right, um, from the total population, right? Which is n choose k, right? You have n genes, you select big k genes from them, right? the Go category. Um, so this is the number of combinations. But then up here, you have two separate problems, because you're asking, how many ways could I pick these little k successes within my sample? right? And the other term here is then, how could I pick the remaining successes from all the genes outside of my sample? right? And it has this form, because um, we are, when we're constructing the null distribution, we want to keep these numbers the same. We're not changing the set of the, the, the size of the subsets, right? We're only changing what genes are in that subset, right? And that's why uh, there is this. And of course, you know how you assign the Go category genes inside and outside the sample that's independent, so you can multiply the number of combinations there in the numerator. That's why you, this is the expression of the hypergeometric. Turns out this is always between 0 and 1, right? It's a probability of getting little k. Um, it's always between 0 and 1 is a probability. And if you sum over all possible values of little k, you get what? One? Right, it's normal. Uh, right? It's a probability distribution, so it has to, up, uh, has to add up to 1. Okay, now this is how R does it. Um, 
let me just switch back to this one and then see what's different. Right? The only thing that's different is that instead of specifying the population size, we're just specifying the total number of you know, successes and non-successes, right? The two number of blue and red uh, and marbles in our urn. But then it's still the sample size, um, K, which is now called K, right? So that's also potentially confusing. <laughs> So it's always good to have an intuitive thought, not just remember the names of the symbols, right? And then the size of our overlap is called x in the... Uh, of course, you can call it k in your code, right? But if you go to the, uh, the, the, the page that explains this, um, uh, you know, in, in R, do question mark uh, Fisher test, for instance, or uh, question mark um, d hyper, which is the name of the command that gives you the uh, hypergeometric probability. Um, they will call it X there. All right, so this is, um, so far I've been talking about Fisher's uh, exact test and, uh, and using the hypergeometric to score a Go association. Let's, let's briefly go back to this issue of um, multiple testing, right? Because in reality, what we have, we'll have this tree where the top level node is all genes, right? And then we'll have large subcategories of, of functional annotation and then more refined categories of more specialized annotation, right? These are not independent gene sets. They have relationships within this tree structure, right? Um, and so it's not strictly correct to assume all these Go categories uh, as independent, but it's conservative. That is, the p-values that you get if you make that assumption uh, are actually um, larger uh, than they might have been if you dealt with this uh, more exactly. So you don't have to worry about uh, scoring or find, calling something statistically significant that is not really significant. You might have find more, found more stuff if you if you'd done this uh, in a more exact way, uh, right? But the p-values for, for this kind of scoring are usually very significant, 10 to the minus 10, uh, minus 16, so it's not typically something you have to worry about uh, too much. Right? And, and again, in the lab, we'll, we'll be talking about how to uh, how to correct for multiple testing, uh, for instance, using uh, an FDR or Bofferoni correction. Okay. Um, so now I want to switch to the, the second uh, topic is how you score Go association based on the distribution of the genes. So this is a, a different way of thinking about the expression uh, or, you know, the, the, this problem. Um, let's again think about our Go category, right, with the K genes. But now, instead of worrying about overlap of um, um, with with Go categories or with um, you know with with, with our set of uh, upregulated genes, we're going to ask something about the average log ratio of the genes in that um, in that Go category. So um, let's draw a normal distribution. Right, and what I'm showing here is the log ratio and then the probability of, of having a particular log ratio, right? So we've done an experiment. We have, say, 10,000 genes, right? And every gene, we've constructed this expression log ratio between the two conditions. So you can think of that value for every gene as a tick mark, a tick mark on this axis, right? So most genes will have values near the center of the distribution, near zero, right? Log ratio equal to zero, ratio equals to one, no change, no difference, right? And then it will be genes that were further out in the tail of the distribution. And that's why you get this shape. Now, um, the width of this distribution, right, it will be sigma, which is the standard deviation the standard deviation of this uh, of this distribution. Um, now let's say that we have k uh, genes in our Go category, right? We we say we were asking, is this Go category special relative to this experiment? What we could do is we could take all the genes that are in that Go category and take the average of the log ratios of all those. Genes. Right, so it's always the same set of genes, um, and we'll we'll look at the 
at the distribution. Now, if we would have picked k genes randomly from all the genes in the genome, right? And we computed the mean, and then we did this again, right? Many times. What would the distribution look like? Would it be the same width, or would it change its width? That would be more narrow, right? Because the if I take the average over a bunch of genes, I'm going to be above the mean mu over here, or below the mean, but it's going to cancel. It's going to average out, right? And I'm going to the more genes I average over, the closer I tend to get to the mean of the genome-wide distribution. So it turns out that the width of of this distribution of the average value of the log ratio, let me call that x, right, over the set of k genes, that that is what we call the standard error of the mean. It's equal to the standard deviation, SD, divided by the square root of the set, right, the sample size. Okay. So if you have a Go category that contains 100 genes, then the width of the distribution of means for an average of 100 genes would be one tenth of the distribution of, uh, in a, of the you know, of the width of the distribution of all genes. Okay. So you get more sensitive to changes in gene expression, and that's the essence of why this is a good approach for looking at differential expression at the level of, of gene sets. That if I would draw a vertical line here. Right. Let's say minus one, and if this is the log base two of you know of the ratio, they would correspond to a, a twofold down regulation, right? For a single gene, this could not be very significant. For instance, the area under the tail here, you know, could be not so impressive, not a significant p-value. But relative to this distribution of the mean of a hundred genes, right, you're far out in the tail, and you would have a very small p-value, right? So you get something significant for the average of 100 genes, where, you know, in the, when, when each of these genes individually would not be uh, uh, significantly differentially expressed. Okay. So I want to stress this, this distribution is the null distribution for the average of these K genes in the Go category, right? If I have a particular category there's some, the mean has just one value, right? It's whatever average log ratio I get for those K genes in the, in the Go category. But to assign a p-value to this mean uh, expression log ratio, I have to construct a null distribution, right? And for that, I will assume that the, I pick the same K genes randomly from the set of all genes. Right? And then I know that that would be a normal distribution with a width that is you know, smaller by one over the square root of, of the size of the gene set. So there's a couple of uh, implementations of, of, of this idea that kind of started in the mid-2000, uh, 2000, 2005. Um, and again, it's very easy to do this with just standard R code, which is what we'll do. So basically here you only need little k. You don't need big k or big k. Yeah, you only need, so there's no sample. That's a good point, because how do we get this set of genes is by asking which genes are differentially expressed at a single gene level. Right? Accounting for multiple testing and all that. And what is nice about this approach is that you don't have to do that. Right? You're in a way you're deferring this question of statistical significance until you've you've used the Go category. So you're using all the genes, we're using the expression of all the genes, both the ones that are, you know, in the Go category and the ones that are outside. And we're asking is the distribution of the log ratios of the genes in the Go category different from that of all the other genes? Of the Go category or of the little case? Um, no, there's, there's no little case. So, um, so I should erase. Uh, right, so here we're just asking if this is our population of, of all genes. I have only have these K genes in the Go category, right? These are the genes that are Go. These are the ones that are not Go. And I'm asking, is the distribution of the log ratio values of these genes in the Go category different from the distribution of the values outside the Go categories? 
There's lots of ways now of testing for differences in distribution, right? And if you can assume that they're more or less normally distributed, one, uh, well, you know, widely used test is to look for differences in means between, you know, these K genes and the remaining genes. Right? And so that's on the next slide. Um, if you look at the at the bottom here, right? Um, this would be stand for the mean log ratio of all the genes in the GO category. So there are big K genes that we're taking an average over here. This would be the big N minus big K genes that are remaining, right? And this is the average expression log ratio of those. And if this GO category is somehow related to the experiment, right, if these genes are either higher or lower, it means that these values would not be the same, right? And um, how do I score how different they are? Well, I have to take into account the, the fluctuations that I get from my measurement error, et cetera, right? So um, I have to measure this difference in means in the right units, and the unit is the standard error of the mean, which is what I wrote um, over here, right? It's the standard deviation divided by the size of the gene set. Question? When you make that comparison, you have a lot of Yeah, so um, it, it would be just all the genes that you have a measurement for, right? right? So not all the genes. It's related to the, the previous question, I guess, that uh, right, genes that you don't know uh, any, the log ratio for, you couldn't make part of your analysis. So it also doesn't make sense that to put them in the negative set, right? So your universe would be the set of all genes that you have a value for, and then you would uh, score, you partition it according to this, this uh, gene ontology category, and then compute means for both sets. But it's not a non-zero value, right? Because it's zero, it's because it's not, even if it's in the array, it means it's not the expression of that whole population. Right. So you just want to make sure we're not confused about zero, because here, when when I say zero, it is the zero log ratio between the two conditions, which is really a ratio of one between the test and the reference, right? And I, I think you're talking about the mRNA level itself or the intensity being low, so low that it's basically in the background and you couldn't take a ratio of two numbers like that, right? So, um, yeah, so you would, you would, well, now this is a little subtle because if for one of the conditions it's high and the other it's very low, right, you could still impose some kind of lower bound and, and which, you know, limits the ratio and the log ratio, but that would be okay because you would still be confident that it's differentially expressed. Um, I want to uh, also mention gene set enrichment analysis, which is a, another way of, uh, of, of uh, looking at, at this difference in distribution of, the, of, uh, of genes. This is based on a, on a, on a test that's called the, uh, the komogorov uh, smirnov test. Um, uh, in the first implementation of this uh, idea, it was the standard KS that, that, w that was used. The thing is that Differences in distribution can come from in, in very different, uh, in, in multiple different ways. And for instance, if you have, you know, your set of genes in the Go category, um, which has a wider or somewhat skewed distribution relative to the rest of the genome, but it's not really shifted, right? This would still show up as a statistically significant uh, uh, a p value, right? And so there was a more uh, there was an update to this algorithm where they only weigh the genes in the tails, con construct a kind of statistic that uh, that is more ad hoc, um, and uh, and then you would have to construct a sam sampled, numerically sampled null distribution to get uh, p-values. Um, I think that the t-test is uh, is achieving the same thing in a, in a simpler way, and it's easy to implement. So that's why in the lab we're we're letting you use the t-value to do this. Uh, and you, you know, you can make uh, cumulative distribution function plots 
to look at the data. That's also a good guiding principle in general that you don't want to just plug in some numbers in a test and get one summary statistic out and just run with that and put it in your paper and publish it, right? You always want to look at the, at the data. If you're doing a regression, you want to make a scatter plot of x versus y um, before you, you draw a straight line, a fit a straight line to it and, you know, and compute the, the p-value for the slope. Um, same is true here. If you if you look at um, um, you know this kind of data, you want to to compare the actual distribution of the genes in your goat category with that of the genes outside the goat category. And, um, and the best way to draw a histogram is, is as a cumulative distribution function. Have you used the ECDF command already? No. If not, we'll, we'll talk about it this afternoon. Um, it's basically the area under the under the histogram, right? So this is one way of drawing the distribution, but in reality, if you have a bunch of data, you have to pick a bin size, right? And you'll have to count how many genes fall in a particular bin. And the bin size, that's kind of an art, how to pick the bin size relative to the actual data. The nice thing about the cumulative distribution function is that you don't have to pick a bin size. Um, you will just draw a function that goes from zero which means none of the data points to one, which means all of the data points. And what you're actually plotting as a function of the same scale, which is the actual scale of your measurements, say the log ratio, right, is uh, this, this distribution as a, it's kind of the area to the left as a staircase that goes up by one st a little step every time you hit one of those tick marks of the actual data, right? So I said, you have 10,000 measurements, there's 10,000 tick marks on this axis, right, each of which is a log ratio for one of the genes. You can imagine if you start all the way to the left, even to the left of the, the leftmost tick mark, right, you have none of your data points are to the left of your threshold, right? And now you start moving to the right, and you hit the first gene, right, the first tick mark. What you then do is you, you go to a value here that is one divided by the total number of genes, right? And every time you hit the next, next tick mark, you go up by another little step, right? And initially, you'll, the steps will happen occasionally, but as you get closer towards the middle of the distribution, right, the steps, the tick marks, and therefore the steps are close to each other. And this curve will become steeper and steeper. It's always the same vertical step size, which is one over the number of data points. But the horizontal distance between these steps is just the distance between the two neighboring measurements, right? So that will vary with the data. And then right around the mean, it will go very fast and then become flatter again. And at some point, you'll have passed through the rightmost tick mark and you're at 100%, you have all your data points and you have made exactly as many little steps up as there are data points and the step size was one divided by the number of data points and that gets you to a value of one, right? So this is just the integral of this distribution function, right? But you cannot take a real integral because it's discrete, right? So that's why you have to make a histogram, right? And again, the way I was explaining how you construct this, you notice I didn't use the concept of bins. You don't have to choose a bin, right? So I think that it may take a little bit of getting used to this representation, but as soon as you're comfortable with it, I think it's much better than trying to plot histograms or, or density. And say now I want to look at this problem of, of a Go category, I could use two different colors and draw two different curves like this for these genes and then all the genes that are not in the Go category, right? And that would then show as a shift between these two cumulative distributions. Maybe the, the ones for the genes in the Go category would look like this. Right? And then we're asking again, is this shift which I'm not really defining accurately here, right? But is that shift, is that, is that statistically significant? But again, the way we put a p-value to on the difference between these two curves or the difference between two different histograms, right, is by first summarizing each of the curves in terms of its mean, right? Do that for the black curve and for the orange curve here. And then take the difference between those two means so that would be something like this arrow, this distance over here. And then asking, what would this dis distance be distributed as if I would have picked these two subsets randomly? Using the same values, right? So the same total set of tick marks, but then picking the orange tick marks out of the total set 
in a different way, keeping the number of orange tick marks the same, right? Um, and that would be, turns out, this null distribution would be a normal distribution that's just more narrow than the overall distribution, right? And that then gives you a, a way of computing a p-value because you would say, okay, now my actual difference of means is somewhere over here. It would be the area under this distribution. Uh, and maybe if I don't care about whether it's up or down beforehand, um, I would just sum up the area under both tails. I get a two-sided p-value, right? But that's how I would go from a uh, difference of means to a p-value ultimately. Okay, when um, we're next door, I will I'll, uh, show a way of, of iteratively selecting uh, sets of genes. Uh, uh, you know, we, we can do the scoring of all the Go categories in parallel, right, and then sort them by p-value and, and say, the most significantly enriched categories on top of the list. Uh, but there's a lot of overlap between these different gene sets, right? And there's, there's some ways of, of dealing that and picking a representative Go category uh, for each set of Go categories that are all overlap with each other. Right? Uh, that's more for those of you who go through this relatively fast. You could try to see if you can implement this, right? But, but, but the, you know, the, the main tutorial is um, uh, just to try to do the basic Fisher exact, uh, exact test scoring and the basic t-test based scoring, so you get familiar with both the, you know, the um, the packages for Go and for gene annotation, and then how you actually use the t-test and Fisher exact. And we'll be talking about this universe thing uh, a little bit as well. Okay, now just one final kind of philosophical remark. If we have an expression profile, right, and we have a bunch of Go categories and we're trying to score the Go enrichment, you know, based on that expression data, that is going to tell us something about the, you know, the physiological state that the cell is in, right? That these genes went up, right? So this is how this cell type, this sample differed from the the reference sample, it's not going to tell us anything about how those changes in gene expression came about, right? What was the causal chain of the molecular interactions that, that, that caused these genes to change? And that is really what we'll be interested in uh, a lot, you know, in the last next uh, lectures that are coming up is to, to talk about uh, this, um, the regulatory networks of the cell and, and for shipping factors and all that, right? Um, and, you know, all I've covered so far is very generic for any kind of gene set you can do this scoring, right? You could imagine that you define the set of genes as the set of targets of a particular Crossup factor, right? And then this scoring would have more of a regulatory interpretation than a physiological interpretation, right? And that's one thing we'll be doing. We will mostly be using more sophisticated re regression-based methods to, to deal with this uh, question of what are the regulatory pathways that are causing the changes in the expression that we're seeing.